Tim Gilmore has written 22 books, including Box Broken Open, The Architecture of Ted Pappas, Murder Capital, Eight Stories, The Book of Isaiah, A Vision of the Founder of a City, illustrated by Shep Shepherd, and The Mad Atlantis of Virginia King. Four of the works he's written for the stage have been produced by Florida State College at Jacksonville Drama Works, and his writing has appeared in numerous publications, both locally and nationally. His website, Jack Psycho Geo, has received mention in publications including the Miami Herald, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker. He's received awards from FSCJ, the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville, and Jacksonville City Council, and he currently teaches literature and writing at Florida State College at Jacksonville. Tim will be joined in conversation with fellow professor Shep Shepard. Shep is a professor of English at FSCJ's Nassau Center, um, and he received his PhD in English from the University of Florida, and he has worked as a full-time instructor at FSCJ for 20 years. We love it when our interviewer and interviewee know each other. <laughs> so in his spare time, he produces music under various monikers, edits fiction and nonfiction prose, creates digital art, and enjoys time with his wife, Anna, and their dogs, Mecca and Moxie. So Shep, I'll leave the rest to you. Tim, never make my bio follow yours ever again. <laughs> I, I should have, I, I didn't mention my dogs and I'm kind of bummed out about that. Well, I thought we'd start with just asking you, who is Warren Folks and why this project now? Yeah, so uh, Warren Folks was uh, someone who uh, was a self-avowed white supremacist. I think it's important to say self-avowed because there are people who um, are not quite so open about it, uh, who ran for office from Jacksonville for uh, more than three decades, uh, went from one kind of public conspiracy theory to another constantly, um, was constantly in the news. Uh, it seems like just about anybody who was, uh, was around in Jacksonville in the 60s and the 70s and to a lesser extent the 80s, uh, you know, has <laughs> distinct and not necessarily fond memories of, of Warren folks. So um, I first, uh, I, I, I had known who he was, I think, primarily because Rodney Hurst has a chapter in his book. It was never about a hot dog and a Coke. Um, the chapter is called Warren Folks. And, um, but I had kind of forgotten about him. And uh, last November, I was looking up um, book bans that had happened in Florida in previous decades. And I ran into um, this story about Warren Folks. Uh, protesting a Mickey Spillane novel that he found in the main library uh, when it was a few blocks that way. Uh, and uh, he, he called for an emergency session of the entire city council. It did not happen. Uh, he called the book, if you know Mickey Spillane, he's a, he's a crime novelist uh, from uh, 60s and 70s primarily, I think. Um, and uh, he called the book Hardcore Pornography, which it is not. Uh, and, uh, and I was like, who is this guy? Uh, and uh, I actually came down to this room, which is one of my favorite places in the city, uh, to see how much of a Times Union file there may have been on Warren Folks. Sometimes if I ask, there's a folder about this big, sometimes there's nothing, um, and, um, and there was a stack about this big. So, um, I started digging into him. I don't know if I would have written about him in, uh, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, uh, but so much of what I uh, was reading about seemed like it had resonances with now. He was, he was a culture warrior uh, before that phrase was, was really used very much. Uh, so um, so I, I, I dug in and I felt like it's, it, was, it was a project, um, honestly, partly, sounds strange to say, but for my own sanity in this time period, like as a way to kind of deal with some of the things that are going on. Which leads me a little bit to ask you about your process a little bit. Like when you put a book like this together, what does that research project look like or that process look like? Because, you know, you, you interesting mix, obviously, like newspaper archives and things like that. But you also go out and beat the street and talk to people. Um, I don't know if I want to spoil some of the people you talked to at the end of this book, which is really interesting. And I'm, I'm very interested in the way in which 
uh, folks sort of haunts the the book because he's what we know about him is so much from those like newspapers and stuff. But I mean, uh, compared to some of the other books that you've written, I feel like he drifts around in here, and he also drifts around in some of the people's lives that you know he might you might think that he was innately connected to. But going back to the to my, my question, how do you put a project like this together research wise? How does that take shape? So I, sh I should just say as an aside that when Shep and I get together, we usually instantly get off course in about two minutes and we and it's been like two hours of, of talking before we realize it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it differs depending on the project, uh, you know, and obviously I try and find as many sources as possible. Um, uh, folks got national attention often. Uh, he was in Life magazine in 1965. Um, he um, he had some very strange capers that took him out to California, uh, and he made made national news in a, a number of different ways. Um, but uh, but absolutely, it's it's um, it's essential uh, to think about who might have known the person you're writing about if it's you know someone within recent memory um, and and to talk to those people I mean those are those are you can you can get um, all kinds of dense information from you know journalism's uh, first draft of history there's that saying right um, but um, when you talk to people like I, I talked to Mike Tolbert who uh, was press aide for um, Mayor Jake Godbold, uh, amongst other things. Um, he had some distinct memories. Um, and um, I, I found out about, I saw hints of some family members of Warren Folks that kept surprising me. Uh, and, um, and eventually I, I, I knew that I had to try and find out if those people were still alive and to talk to them and get their perspectives. This book, to me, is more reporterly, in a sense, in the way that it proceeds. I worked, I had the great pleasure of working with you on, on the book of Isaiah, which was like a fever dream, unlike anything that would be a history book that I could imagine, which leads me to, to ask you about that, inter, that intersection between your narrative, um, your, your creative narrative side and the historical stuff that you bring to the table. How do you balance that? And I guess connected to that, how do you see yourself in relation to being a writer of history? Like, do you, you've told me before you're not a writer of history. Uh, and, and, I mean, if, if someone was to ask, is Tim Gilmore a historian? Right. So how do you perceive what you're doing there and how do you balance that, that interesting creative style that you have with the, the the reporterly side of what you do. I'd love to even just kind of philosophize about these kinds of things, actually. Um, yeah, uh, I, you know, I do write a lot about history. Um, I don't consider myself a historian. You and I have similar, you know, we're both English majors, right? <laughs> and, you know, went to grad school, too. But um, I think of that as, you know, I mean, um, going to grad school for English taught me to read deeply in lots of different ways and apply lots of different lenses. And um, I'm not saying that if I had gone to school for history, that wouldn't have happened. Obviously, it would have. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I come from it from thinking of or come to it from thinking of myself as a writer, first and foremost. So, um, I, you know, um, whether it's my reading or what I'm trying to do with uh, with um, telling a story, I think uh, I'm kind of working between two polarities, one of which is journalism, maybe more in the sense of like, you know, not to flatter myself, but Joan Didion or the new journalism, as it was often called, um, and, and poetry. Um, you know, poetry was one of my first loves. I mean, you know, I focused my dissertation on um, Walt Whitman and um, his uh, influences on 20th century American poetry. So, um, so, uh, so there is, I guess, the fever dream aspect of things. I think of history as haunting, you know? Um, I think of story as being the biggest part of the word history. And I think of um, the way history haunts us, the way it moves us, um, and these kind of forces that are mostly invisible to us and that a lot of times we're hardly even aware of as being, um, you know, much more terrifying than a lot of supernatural horror, really. You know, 
sometimes in this book, one of the most interesting things I got out of it was when you start talking about who Warren folks could have been and who he was. And there's a sense in which at the end of the book, you almost try to rescue him a little bit, not in the sense that you're making excuses for him, but that you want to understand how he was shaped by forces beyond his control. And it's interesting because when I read about your own biography and where where you come from and what you experienced and where you ended up, I thought you might feel a little bit of brotherhood to some extent with with Warren folks a little bit because because of not because you were you're anything like him or that you that this you, is the part where I storm angrily <laughs> off stage. No, but I thought that last part was was your. You, it's not that you sympathized with him, but you sympathized with who he could have been. You know, you sort of wanted to rescue something of that from him and not just leave it where, where it was, you know, in the earlier chapters. I mean, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and connect it a little bit to your bio. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that I could just, like, leave here now and just go home and write about for two hours. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's, there's so many different ways I could answer that. Um, I think that, well, when I write about somebody, um, especially somebody who's no longer alive, I mean, I'm trying to get to know them somehow, you know? Um, I think my favorite project that I've ever worked on is uh, the Mad Atlas of Virginia Kings, this, you know, um, very unusual woman who wrote this um, mostly unreadable book. Um, there, the fourth edition is here over in the stacks over there. The, the final edition um, the Historical Society has, and it's all handwritten. It's 8,448 pages. It takes up a shelf like that. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I felt like I got to know her maybe as much as it would have been possible to um, get to know her when she was alive because she was not somebody easy to get to know. Um, and uh, But, uh, you know, I think it is really easy to, uh, with somebody like Warren Folks, um, instantly put them in the corner where they belong and, you know, throw darts at them, right? And uh, he did lots of reprehensible things. He hurt people, you know? I don't necessarily mean physically, although he did that too. But you know, he he was a he was a destructive, hateful person. Um, but I also wonder, you know, uh, what makes somebody like that? And so I think about some of where he came from, which I, I came to understand a little bit, and some of the things that happened to him, and how they may or may not have uh, influenced his life. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm not, but it's not inconceivable that I could be distantly related to this guy, you know? That's really, <laughs> that's a pretty uncomfortable thing to say, um, you know? Uh, um, I, my family comes from the South for a really long time. Um, I think my parents were good people, uh, but, you know, there's some stuff back in Georgia um, from my dad's time and before, a little bit that I know of, that is really, really unsettling, and, um, you know, there are things that, um, there are stories that my, my dad, I should say, was, was 50 when I was born. Um, he would be 100 next year if he were still alive. He died five years ago. Um, but, you know, there were stories that he told when I was growing up that were things that he thought were funny or even things that he, um, you know, he had a, uh, he had a, a, an uncle named Phil Gilmore who uh, was his hero. And, and Phil Gilmore was, uh, was a police officer in um, Oglethorpe and Americus and some other places um, in, in Georgia around that area. Uh, and, um, you know, growing up, my, I would hear my dad talk about um, Phil Gilmore's open acts of racism, you know, and um, accompanied by violence. Uh, and, uh, and my dad had idolized this guy. So when I was growing up, when I was a little kid and I heard these things, I heard them the way my dad wanted me to hear them. And obviously, as I got a little bit older, they started to affect me quite differently. And now I, I 
you know, I kind of feel, I feel a little bit haunted by some of those things. I mean, they're back there. I come from that. I, you know, I can't, um, I can't, I can disavow it, but I can't, um, I can't cancel that fact. So, um, that must mean that, um, wherever you're from, there are lots of different ways you could go. So what made Warren folks into the person that he was? I think it's really important to ask those kinds of questions. I mean, we're educators, you know? So um, people come to us from all different places in their lives and backgrounds, and you know, we wanna reach them in the best way possible. It's kind of a question of how do we remember and what do we remember? Right. I mean, and I think that ties in sort of with your overall project. And I, I like to connect it to like the idea of, of building an archive. Mm. You know, I mean, you've done what, 21 books, 22 books. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off there with one. Um, but 22 books of that's an impressive feat. Um, I think all of them are basically centered on Jacksonville, Jacksonville history. Most. I mean, most of them, at least the ones I've encountered. And, and I think all of those questions about how we remember, what we remember, and, and why are just embedded in what you write. And I, I have a quote from my favorite philosopher, Jacques Derrida, and he says, the archive is a violent initiative taken by some authority, some power. It takes power over the future. It confiscates the past, the present, and the future. Everyone knows there is no such thing as innocent archives which I also thought is really pointing towards the legitimacy of your project. When we think about history and we want to maybe erase any of the subjective parts of it, there seems to me that you're very honest about how you, you inter interweave your biography with history. And you, you, you talk about, uh, your website's called Jack Psycho Geo, right? Say a little bit about psychogeography, just for a minute to, to tie this in, because what I'd like to ask you is how does biography tie in with what you would understand as the concept of psychogeography. So I, I, I love that Derrida quote, um, uh, which also reminds me of, a, of James Baldwin saying that um, uh, uh, the authors of devastation cannot be permitted to be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime, which he says in um, The Fire Next Time. Uh, so yeah, so <laughs> the website has this bizarre name, um, Psychogeo is short for psychogeography, which is something like the spirit of place. It's the psychology of geography. Um, there are a number of, um, uh, writers who have been referred to and artists who have been referred to as psychogeographical writers. Um, a lot of them are, are English novelists and poets, but people have even um, made a big point about some of Edgar Allan Poe's stuff and Walt Whitman's stuff as being psychogeographical. It's, it's something that explores the geography of place. Um, and um, with my website, I mean, I realize it's fully my fault because it's a weird name that, you know, people... Um, <laughs> mess up the name all the time um and you know i'm always forgiving of that because it's a bizarre name but it's kind of unfortunate when people call it jackpsycho.com because that <laughs> feels like a totally different connotation than what i was going for so um but it is i mean it's uh, uh i think place affects us profoundly and um we're often unaware of just how profound it's, it, it affects us. And, you know, and I grew up here, this is my hometown. And, um, you know, I grew up on a <laughs> 50s ranch style, kind of yesterday's suburb sort of, of place. Um, and it did not seem like it had much of a sense of place when I was growing up. Uh, you know, and everybody that I knew growing up said they wanted to get out of Jacksonville as quickly as possible. Um, I think that brain drain problem has, um, is not as bad as it used to be, but I think it still exists too. Um, but you know, I thought of, um, this as being kind of a placeless place, um, when I was growing up and, um, I think probably when I was a teenager and started exploring Riverside and, you know, some of these um, places that were not yet gentrified, but were just like where the weirdos went, you know, um, is when I started really kind of becoming fascinated with place and with architecture and with history and um, just fe well, always having kind of a sense of wondering how much has happened in the place where I am right now. 
And, and how does that, not in a supernatural sense, although it's pretty spooky, but how does that actually affect the present? You know, there are patterns of history that happen over and over. Why has Jacksonville been thought of as the murder capital of Florida for like a hundred years? For real, that's not a new phenomenon. So, um, you know, uh, and, and how does that fact affect us when we're talking about policy changes? I mean, I hope that when we have, you know, when there our homicide rate escalates, that um, you know we can have policy changes that change things, but. Um, but also there are clearly long, deeply rooted historical factors at work too. Maybe to bring this back a little bit to, to the book itself and some specifics there, can you talk a little bit about the encounter between Spillane and, and, <laughs> and folks? And, and I mean, there's, it's, a, it's a very amusing anecdote yeah. as well, although yeah. there's also some interesting in your book, you have some interesting quotes from Spillane about being a writer and writing yeah. and what that means. Yeah, uh, it's if, of any writer that um, Warren Folks could have picked on, Mickey Spillane was in some ways perfect because you know, he, if you don't know much about or anything about Mickey Spillane, um, you know, I don't think he's not too widely read anymore, but he was very, a very macho guy. Uh, you know, he wrote, uh, he had this um, kind of alter ego that was also protagonist of a lot of his, his true crime novels named Mike Hammer. Um, and Mike Hammer, you know, got into brawls and chased women and, you know, uh, and Mickey Spillane didn't didn't mind if you confused him with Mike Hammer. Um, he, you know, he had the, so uh, the, the book that um, Warren Folks was deeply offended by um, had Mickey Spillane's wife posing nude on the cover. She was 23, he was like 48. Um, that's the kind of person he was. Um, actually, my wife and I have been watching Columbo recently, <laughs> and there's an episode where Mickey Spillane shows that he plays this this um, this macho writer who gets killed off in the first few minutes, so you don't have to see what a bad actor he is for an hour and a half. But um, <laughs> but of all people for Warren Folks to pick on, and a lot of these, despite the fact, I think despite the fact that Warren Folks is this, this, this horrific kind of character, a lot of the things that he got himself into ended up being pretty, from a distance, amusing, you know? Uh, and so Mickey Spillane said, oh, you know, this guy in Jacksonville wants to ban my books? I'm, let's go. <laughs> so he and, and, and his, his wife uh, came to Jacksonville, had a big press conference, um, Mickey Spillane made the most of it, you know, um, he, he, um, he, he, um, challenged Warren folks. He called him Warren to keep helping out with his book sales and said he would write Warren folks as a character into his next novel, which I don't think he did disappointingly, but, um, and, uh, yeah, he came to, he came, he had a, a press conference at the main library when it was a, again, a few blocks that way. Um, uh, uh, wore this mesh polo shirt that was really, really tight and had these, uh, these threads that were like shoelaces with all his chest hair poking out. And, um, you know, and when people asked him things about writing, asked Mickey Spillane things about writing, you know, he said, uh, you know, I write for the buck. And, um, uh, somebody asked him, um, what about writing about social issues? And he said, that kind of thing doesn't pay well and you won't get me writing about any social issues until it does. And, and he said, um, we know from, from life that if you have two men and one woman or two, two women and one man, then you get murder. And that's what I write about. Uh, and, uh, he, he, I think he absolutely loved that. Warren folks try to get his book banned and that he got to come to this town and I mean it made national news um, and uh, and he got to play himself in front of the cameras <laughs> it's of all people for Warren folks to have, have picked on for me there's this hilarious moment a few pages later when they ask Warren folks why are you running for office and the first thing he says is well I need a buck oh. I really need the money he yeah, does, and then yeah. he goes, and then, and then he launches into like this tirade about, but I couldn't help but see the connection between these two guys that were, in a sense, carny promoters. 
And, 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 and I know something about, you know, the kind of cultural studies that you have done and like to do too, <laughs> and that, that fits perfectly into them. Um, and there is something to that, I mean, you know, uh, so, um, yeah, I kept asking myself, I, oh, whoever I'm writing about, I, I want to know what drove this person. I mean, people are strange. People are complicated. People are fascinating. What drove Virginia King to write, um, you know, this, this book uh, that went through multiple um, versions and she walked across the city and took crooked photos because she couldn't slow down enough to get the, the picture straight um, every, you know, like every day for, for decades. Um, what drove her, uh, you know? And, and so I kept asking myself, what, what drove Warren Folks? And in particular, I was really interested in the question of, I mean, he was so hateful, you know, and I wonder how, I, it, it seems to me that that kind of hate is that kind of bitterness is painful um it's not a happy place to be you know and um and so i wonder how does um how does that kind of hate not burn itself out and it seems to be um it seems to be its own fuel uh but at the same time um he warned folks was never somebody to um do something from the background I mean, he was, he was in front, um, even if there were only three people protesting, um, it would be Warren folks, um, and two of his buddies and he would be doing it in the most obnoxious and offensive way possible. Um, and there was some very bizarre because the guy did not mind being hated by lots of people. Um, but there was, there was definitely showmanship to it, you know, um, and so then the question is why? I mean, he kept himself um, in the headlines from the early 1960s as long as he could. He was, uh, you know, by the mid 90s, he was still doing a lot of what he was doing before, but uh, people just didn't care as much. He was old, he was sick, he ended up, not to give too much away, but he ended up homeless for a while. Uh, and um, he was not the threat that he seemed to have been when he was early on, even if, you know, he could never get elected. He has these bizarre misadventures, like in California, with a guy that's, I mean, even crazier than he is, where he ends up living with this guy who, I mean, there's just this, he's, it, the book keeps getting weirder, you know? I mean, that was one of the things I, I, I picked up on as I was finishing it. And then it has this really interesting final chapter where, you know, we don't know a lot about him in this book at the, at the beginning. We see, we watch him do things. But, and, and then at the end, there is this last chapter where we sort of fill in the blanks a little bit about how he got there. I mean, we don't know that much about his early childhood or anything like that, but you, you, you provide us with some of that information at the end, you know, and I thought that was, it was, it was, it was just, it was mountingly weird as you go through the book. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's as weird as any, like a Flannery O'Connor novel or anything else, but it's totally nonfiction. And I think, I think, you know, I can say a couple of things about um, questions that I'm asking and things I'm finding out toward the end without them really being spoilers because I don't actually have answers as to what they all mean. But, uh, you know, there were some things that happened to him. Uh, he was in the Navy in World War II uh, and he ended up, um, I don't want to say too much about it, but he ended up on a uh, former Nazi cruiser uh, and uh, he did something to help with atomic bomb testing in the in the Pacific Islands. Um, how did those things? I mean, shortly after he's fighting in World War II, um, shortly after uh, he's a civilian, he's a member of the American Nazi Party. How, so you have to ask, like, how does that happen? You know, um, and. Um, I, I found out that, you know, he was estranged from um, two daughters. And, uh, and I, so, you know, I found them and I spoke to them and they have very different takes on their father. 
Um, uh, but, you know, I think it would have been, uh, I, I don't know how I could have, I couldn't have stood feeling like I'd made some attempt to finish the book without trying to talk to them. When I said he sort of haunts this book, in the first part of the book, he haunts the city. In the last part of the book, he haunts, in a strange way, his family, because he sort of appears and disappears. And, you know, the impact of that on them is really interesting. Like you said, these two very different takes on who he was right. from, from both of their perspectives. But I thought that was a really interesting little twist there. Um, so, so that was, I mean, I, I think that's a, I think that the last part of this book really, that's where I saw a little more of you again, kind of appearing and, and whereas the first part of the book, like I said, is a little more sequential linear. There are moments where the city gets some, some personification or some of your action verbs show up there, but you know, um, I just think it, I, I think that I, I wonder how much you thought about that structure, you know, how much, I mean, you know, how much does, does that kind of thing play into how when do you know that that's how this is going to work um i try not to know too much ahead of my doing it actually but um i could kind of see that that was going to be the shape of this because i could see um what parts of the narrative i could could track down through talking to people in the city who remembered him and doing you know and 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 doing basic research and then knowing that um, the, a lot of the big questions that I still had were going to be things that I um, uh, were going to be harder to track down. So you and I have talked a little bit about your fascination with the hobo or the vagabond, right? I mean, and there's a weird sense that, that this guy's a little bit lives like that on the street. I mean, his life is on the street. Does he ever really cut hair? I mean, that was one of the questions. He's always wandering around. He's, he's, the, he's a barber. We left that yeah. out. Oh yes, he was, uh, But but people don't have. A, there's not a lot of a lot of memory of him cutting hair. Um, he lives in his barber shop for a while. He, like you said, he may be homeless. But in a lot of your work, you're really interested with these wanderers, kind of mad wanderers. And I, I think that to some extent, does that connect to your feelings about living in Jacksonville? where you are sort of fascinated, you wander the streets, you're interested in the architecture, but like in some of your work, let me, let me quote you from an early uh, book here. What, this, was, um, this is from This Kind of City, Ghost Stories and um, Psychological Landscapes. You say, um, you talk about what the work is. You said, this work is my struggle with place. It's my struggle against places from which I've, I've been ashamed to come, places which I've been angered to find myself crawling. That fact will be evident. I've been angered and ashamed to grow up in a town with such a racist history, such a violent history, such a history of poverty and illiteracy. I've been angered and ashamed to attend self-righteous schools that covered up the most despicable crimes of their leaders. But the struggle is deeper and more layered. These are the stories of my having loved deeply, of having lost, of having afterward found patterns in the loss that echoed in my own living as the voices of ghosts. To lose my mother when I was a child and to find her again in my own children, in my own decisions, in the woman I fell in love with, in the places I have lived and in the paths of my mother's movement across the city, strangely corresponding with mine. I mean, so there's an interesting sense in which you're cut off from the city, but you try to find yourself again in it and in, in new ways that you've defined, you know, defined yourself in your different relations. Again, I think I, I, I sometimes see weird, you wrote this interesting book about Otis Toole, the serial killer from Jacksonville. And you apologize or for it. Or is he? Yeah, that is part of the question. <laughs> um, and you, you, you begin that book by sort of apologizing for writing it. And, and, but then there's this weird humanity you find in Otis Toole without, without legitimizing him. And I feel like there's a connection here with this book between Otis Toole and Warren folks for you. And I, I think there's a connection. I, I don't mean this in any insulting way, but you find some connection to them personally uh, is yeah well it that's it's all connected that, that is absolutely true um uh i, I am inter i'm interested in hermits and vagabonds <laughs> um perhaps largely because of their questionable relationship to, to home or place um i don't think i've ever thought about it exactly in the way you just put it that maybe I'm interested in a lot of those things and those kinds of characters because of my own um, 
uh, 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 what would be the right word? Um, well, difficulty with, um, you know, my hometown, which I love. I, 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 I want Jacksonville to be the best city it can be. Um, I am uh, thrilled for it when I feel like it does, it does um, things to deal with its history and make itself better, you know. Uh, but I did, you know, it's interesting because I hadn't thought of the thing that you just read, that particular passage in um, a really long time. Um, but, you know, since I wrote that, I've written other things that that kind of opened up into. I hadn't even thought about that. I mean, you know, I have um, this book, The Devil in the Baptist Church. Um, uh, uh, um, and that has to do with um, this church that's the church that my parents met at um, it's here in this town i went to this the school i attended their school for a few years um, the church covered up the fact that the pastor who um, made it a, a, a big successful church um, sexually abused children for 50 years um, that church is still thriving you know what do you, how do you deal with those kinds of things? How do you, I mean, do you just ignore them? Do you, I, I don't know how to, you know? Uh, and um, so, um, so yeah, all of these things are connected and um, it makes a lot of sense that my own difficulties with the idea of home um, have to do with <laughs> some of the characters that I'm writing about, definitely. When you talk to Rodney Hurst, he says, um, he says, all I can do is acknowledge who and what Warren Folks was to illuminate what he did. The only thing I can do is fight racism. I can't change white people from being racist. Only whites can make that change. How does that connect with what you're doing here? I'm so glad that you read that, you know. Um, uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, I went into, so well, first of all, I, I, I uh, wrestled a good bit with, um, with the fact of writing this book. Um, you know, if I'm just retelling a, a bunch of hateful things that this guy did, what kind of service is that to the community or to readers or to anything else? Um, uh and so I didn't, I didn't just want to like pick up this guy's poison from where he left it off and like say, you know, here, 2023, you can have some of this, you know? Um, so I, I actually, you know, in wrestling with that, um, I, I had lunch with, with Rodney and asked him about that. And, um, and it was a really, really interesting discussion about how um, you write about race or racism from where you are. And that um, it would seem really strange for Rodney Hurst. He would never, he wrote a chapter, it's about three pages, called Warren Folks, but he would never write a, a book about the guy. Why would he? And it would look weird if he did. On the other hand, you know, um, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for um, a white Southerner to interrogate uh, a lot of those kinds of traditions. I see, I see you creeping. <laughs> I love it when my creeping up is acknowledged. <laughs> so thank you guys for such a wonderful conversation thus far. Yeah, it's been wonderful. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and I'm excited to hear more answers to our audience questions, when we're, which we're going to open it up to. Um, so you have the note cards on your clipboard. So if you have any questions, write them down. Volunteers will be collecting them on our Zoom audience. Submit them to the Q&A chat if you have any, and we'll get them here. Someone was an early bird and slipped me a question even before the program started. So we have one to, to get us off. So let me hand it to Shep. And I'll leave it to him to ask these wonderful questions. Okay, Tim, here we go. Race relations are an integral part of Jacksonville history. As we move further and further from the end of slavery, as well as the 1960s moving out of living memory, as well as the 1960s moving out of living memory, the emerging narrative is, why do we have to keep talking about it? As someone who studies history, do you have an answer to this? I, whoever asked that, I'm really glad you did because this is something that comes up a lot, right? Um, I, I find it really interesting um, that 
some people have totally opposite answers to this question, depending on the discussion. For example, um, people who are defensive about um, Confederate monuments um, will say, um, well, you know, uh, this, is, this is history. If you're taking these things down, you're erasing history, which is not the fact at all. I mean, a monument exists to praise something, right? Um, so, and often to praise something in, um, uh, in a dishonest way. Um, so, um, but the same people who say that will say, if you mention, uh, if, you, if you talk about slavery, if you talk about Jim Crow, if you talk about um, how um, those very things um, still uh, affect uh, our, our psychology and culture now, um, you are digging at old wounds or you're stirring things back up again. So then like, how do you have it both ways, you know? Um, and um, I, th you know, I often think I almost, I mean, I kind of roll my eyes at, the, at myself for saying this, but you know, I, for one of the first things that comes to my mind is that Faulkner quote that, you know, the, the past isn't even the past. And I don't think that history is the study of the past. I think it's a study of the present. It's a study of um, how the present uh, is impacted and informed and infused and influenced by the past. The past doesn't go away, you know? Um, it, uh, how much did you learn from your parents? How much did your parents learn from their parents? How much, did, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's amazingly resilient uh, and, um, uh, and that's one of the things that I find fascinating about, about history is that it is um, this storm of invisible, mostly invisible until you start looking for them, um, forces that affect us and shape our lives in lots of ways. It seems like uh, the question of what kind of monuments should we be leaving and building, I think your books participate in that conversation. You know, this is an anti-statue of, of Warren folks in a, in a strange way. Um, here's I a, like that. Yeah, here's, another, sure. here's another question. Um, did Hans Taz Tanzler and Warren folks interact politically? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, so Warren folks... Um, Re, uh, you know, interacted um, really more with political figures starting, I think, in the, yes, some extent in the late 60s, but, but, but especially in, in the 70s, um, um, he is, he's very upset um, by the fact that in um, the late 1960s, um, three years after the Voting Rights Act, um, that um, Jacksonville elects two black women to city council, you know? Uh, and when um, Mary Singleton, one of those two black women, um, decides to run for, um, for uh, state office, he uh, decides to run against her. That's one of the, the motivating factors for him. Um, on up into um, really 19, the early 90s, he actually runs for governor. Um, and uh, when he is not elected, he's never elected to anything. He runs for sheriff, um, council, um, House of Representatives, Senate, and governor. Um, and um, thought about running for mayor, but bowed out. Um, <laughs> But um, he, uh, when he's not elected to the Senate in the late 1980s, um, running against Arnett Girardo, he, um, he goes to Tallahassee anyway and says he's expecting to be seated because the election was stolen. So, um, um, I, you know, I don't think he interacted much with, with, with Tanzler. Um, uh, I think that was just before he started really interacting with, with political figures much. Warren Folks was led by his religious beliefs. What impact has religion had on racial discrimination? And then we have a note here that says, the vast majority of murder has been in the name of God and the advancement of religion. What is your reaction to that statement and question? It's a heavy one. Yeah, yeah, that's a light one. Um, 
It's, it is, um, it is extremely complicated. Um, Warren Folks' father was a minister. Um, Warren Folks um, considered himself a minister. He started something um, that he ran out of his barber shop called the Conservative Church of Christ. Uh, he, um, he, 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 he saw himself. Uh, he, he, he was a very religious person. Of course, lots of Christians would feel very offended by the fact that he called himself a Christian. Um, you know, um, Martin Luther King was a Baptist minister, right? So it's really complicated, and I, I totally understand the sentiments of the statements uh, and premise of, of that question. It's, it's absolutely true, um, but often the opposite is true, too. Religion, <laughs> religion is one of the most powerful f cultural and social forces. It does whatever people who claim it and have um, particular kinds of uh, strengths and skills um, want it to do. Here's a simpler one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Can you just basically cover the, the, just the basics of, of his biography? I guess we didn't really touch that much, just like his date of birth, parents, oh. just his general, just a general overview of, of who this guy we was. We just kind of skipped over that, <laughs> jumped into theory. And yeah, stuff. and part of the question here is also, like, was his connection to the Ku Klux Klan, any of that stuff? So maybe just a real quick overview of this man's history. Yeah, real quick. So he, uh, he grew up in Ocala. Uh, his father was a uh, Church of Christ uh, minister in Ocala. Uh, he, uh, he went into the Navy and served in World War II. Uh, he uh, married, actually, while he was still in the Navy, um, had two daughters. Um, when he got out of the, the, the service, he first um, went into business with his brother in Orlando, but quickly um, came to Jacksonville, and um, there are some things in the book that um, I won't give away, but um, uh, 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 was estranged from his wife and children at that point. Uh, and um, when he got to Jacksonville, he was initially part of the American Nazi Party. He had fallings out with them. Um, he, um, he was also um, initially uh, connected to the Ku Klux Klan. Um, when I was, I mean, looking through, you know, his files, I mean, some of this, I mean, it, it was, um, it's chilling to, you know, holding your hands, at least it was for me, um, the Thunderbolt, which is the, the National States Rights Party um, newspaper um, that, um, that, uh, ob that plenty of times quoted him or there were stories about him in it. Um, and it was run by J.B. Stoner, who was the, um, the attorney for the Ku Klux Klan. He was also the attorney for the, uh, the murderer of Martin Luther King. Um, these are the kinds of people that, he, that um, Warren Folks was associated with. Um, he, uh, he, he, he wasn't good at being connected to any particular group for very long because he just was so contentious about everything. I find that that's often the case with intensely political people on both sides. Like I've seen um, groups on the left just tear each other apart, you know, to the point where it's like, okay, well, you're totally undermining whatever you're trying to do. Um, uh, so, you know, he was, he was a barber, came to Jacksonville in 1960, never left, and um, did a whole bunch of strange things that we've been talking about since then, um, and died in, uh, I, I should know this, I think it was 2011, not that long ago. So, lived a long life. Okay, this question is, do you think Folks was a true activist, or do you think really he was attention, an attention seeker above all? And then connected to that, another question is, what do you think his legacy now is, if he has one? Um, I don't, that's a, that's a really interesting, both of those are really interesting questions. I. I not sure how I could separate his attention seeker from his activism. Um, I think he was he, he was definitely an attention seeker, um, but I think he really strongly believed in the things that he was was trying to get attention. At for. some moments, he tries to kind of shift mainstream a little bit, which is a very odd 
these moments are very strange in the he book does. because you read these just yeah. violent rhetoric and then he has right. this period where he tries to embrace and he even he even uh, he tries to take race out of his co- like his comments and things yeah. like that so I, yeah. I guess that could point a little bit to to the fact that he was you know as he he's able to shift these weird these weird positions at some time. One of the things that he would do is he would buy ad space in newspapers and then he would type up these long, they, they were supposed to look like they were news stories, but it was his ad. So it would be like a, basically a fake news story that was actually a Warren Folks ad and would praise him the whole time. You know, our, our, we need to thank our patriotic, fearless <laughs> leader, Warren Folks. And, um, but um, after uh, there was a certain point uh, for a few years where those ads that he's he's paying for and the Jacksonville Journal and the Florida Times Union started to say things like you know thank you to all my black supporters and when you start to read that it's like you you know it hurts your neck because you just didn't you got some whiplash or something uh, and uh, and it's very strange you know um, uh, uh, he seemed to into the 1980s, focus less, at least publicly, on race. Uh, he started to get very upset about um, gay rights and abortion uh, and um, um, some other things. But uh, in private moments, or not private moments, but when he was on um, public access um, cable television with other white supremacists, he would be just as just brutal and mean and despicable as he had ever been. And very loose with the truth. They're just shifting dates and oh, all. Yeah. Right. Where, to, right. where, to the point where even the host of that hideous program is, is, is looking confused, like, what's happening here? Let's get off the air. <laughs> like, <laughs> Including the host actually seems to think that Warren Folks had been elected to the Senate. <laughs> It's very weird, very weird. And you can still find that, that, that film footage, you know, out there on the internet. All right, here's another one. Often in attempting to portray a character, an actor tries to understand the driving force or the why of a character. Uh, who, what do you think was the, the ultimately kind of connected to what we just talked about? Can you, in some sense, r- recognize or define the driving force of this man? Is there any way to do that? That's what I spent the whole book trying to do. <laughs> and I don't know if I succeeded or not. But um, I, I think it would be really interesting to um, hear readers answer that question. Um, I try to explore it in as many ways and to as much depth as, as possible. Um, ultimately, I think you can only figure out so much about anybody. Uh, and, um, so if you're talking about somebody like Warren Folks, um, that's, that's that much more of a complicated question. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. It says a historian is a philosopher whose predictions are, I think this says trained on the past instead of the future. What do you think about that? A historian is a philosopher whose predictions are trained on the past instead of the future. Ooh, that sounds like a quote from somebody. I don't know who it would be. And that, that by the way, it's a followed up by, can you read your dedication page? Ah, yes. <laughs> I, that part's easier. <laughs> You'll go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to actually do that, yeah. The dedication page says, uh, this book is dedicated to our librarians, the preservers of our history and our culture. We're in a library. <laughs> the other thing... The other thing, that, that, that's, that's really interesting. I'd like to kind of chew on that for a while. It, makes, it sounds kind of Orwellian, you know? It sounds like, I mean, Orwell um, talks about um, those who, I'm not even gonna try and get the quote right. If I had looked at it a couple hours ago, I probably could. But, um, you know, those who uh, um, um, control the past, control the future, uh, but he also looks at it from the other direction. Um, and, um, you know, the, w- you cannot ever go to the past, right? I mean, I don't remember who, some writer said that the past is another country, which I think is interesting, but you can't actually go there. You can't actually go to your own past. If you're trying to understand, you know, 
the year 1810, you can't go there. You can only ever see from the present moment and the present moment is instantly gone. So it's all kind of an illusion, right? But, um, but you have to, you have to um, constantly make those attempts and then reattempt the next minute, you know, because that's changed instantly too. Which points to the incredible, um, the incredible importance of what we can read you know, and, and what we leave behind to read and, and, and is it available to read? And I think that, um, I mean, it, it seems to me that you are participating in all of that in, in your, your leaving behind your legacy, this kind of archive of, of Jacksonville that hasn't existed before. I mean, I've learned most of Jacksonville history from reading your books. <laughs> I don't know. You know I, it's your fault. Tim. I mean, clearly there are, there, there are um, lots of people who have done wonderful um, stuff with Jacksonville history that's very different, I think, than what I've tried to do. But I mean, you know, um, I, I um, look up, uh, you know, um, revisit Jim Crooks and Dan Schaefer and Wayne Wood and, you know, lots of other people constantly. Um, but again, I, I, those people are historians, whether or not they're trained in it, the, the, um, the act um, that they have chosen um, is, is directly history. I, and I, I, it might sound strange that I say that I'm not a historian. I have one friend in particular I'm thinking about that constantly gives me a hard time about that. Um, he calls me the anti-historian and the unhistorian. And but um, you know, uh, um, his, there, there's more history than there is anything else. Nobody knows what the future is. The present's gone instantly. So um, the biggest resource that there is to write from and about is, is history. I, I did leave one question out, so I wanted to get back to it. Um, what is the best approach concerning copyright, specifically pen name? Do you know anything about that? Specifically pen names? That's... I think, I mean, I don't want to like give anybody wrong legal advice or anything. But I think, well, when you publish something, you do create a de facto kind of copyright. You can certainly back yourself up more carefully than that. But I think um, within um, any kind of you know, professional standard of academic writing or historical writing or anything else, um, you're constantly um, pointing to your sources Everything is about sources uh, and um, and acknowledging them and hoping that you know you will be in turn. But I think you know publication is a kind of de facto um, copyright. Um, but um, but you know I, I don't want to. I'm not going to give anybody like not advice, advice to protect them legally or anything. 